You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. Back in the 1970s and early 1980s, FM radio was dominated by stations that played rock music. And it wasn't just the latest hits, it was deep cuts from the albums. And sometimes an album would be so good from beginning to end that one would hear nearly every single track played on the radio at some point. One of these classic albums was Boston by the band of the same name. When I finally purchased a copy of that album in the latter part of the 1980s, I realized I had heard every single one of those songs on the radio at some point. And sure, some of the songs were played more than others. I mean, some to the point of overkill. I mean, how many times can you hear more than a feeling? But I was surprised to find out that I was familiar with every single cut on that record. The reason I mention this is because a line from one of the songs on that Boston album kept going through my mind as I pieced together the material for today's podcast. That song was peace of mind and it had a line that went, everybody's got advice, they just keep on giving. It's hard to say without singing, but that's exactly what today's episode's all about. It's about advice columns, you know, agony aunts or agony uncles. And while everyone's been dishing out their advice since the beginning of mankind, the first known advice column appeared in 1691 in London's Athenian Gazette. That's when editor-in-chief John Dunton formed a society of experts that he called the Athenian Society, and they offered up their expertise to questions that were sent in by readers. And the advice column continues to this day. So today I present something new on the podcast. It's what I'm calling dubious advice, you know, questionable advice. It's an assortment of advice columns from the late 1800s all the way through the 1970s. And I'm hoping as you listen to these, you'll see how advice has evolved over time. I am Steve Swimman and this is the Useless Information Podcast. Useless Information. Hi, everyone. I hope you're doing well. Now, if you've been a long-time listener to this podcast, you probably know that I like to try new things from time to time. And as I'm doing research, I find it interesting to see how the world changes over the years. And, you know, it would be great if I could do a podcast showing you how comics or graphics have changed over time. But, of course, that's impossible with the audio format. But I've had this idea in the back of my head for quite a while to take advice columns and see how the responses, how these columnists have changed their responses over time. Would we still respond the same way today? So what I've been doing is collecting advice columns over the last few months, and I've chosen some of the better ones that I think are good for this podcast. And I think a good place to start is with the column titled Dear Beatrice Fairfax. And it was first published on July 20th of 1898, and it is considered to be the first advice column here in the United States. Although, as you'll hear later in the podcast, I really do believe that honor belongs to Dorothy Dix. The column was penned by Marie Manning, and the story goes that she was working at the New York Evening Journal in 1898, and since women were forbidden from working in the paper's city room, Manning and two other women were relegated to what was referred to as the hen coop to write about women's issues. You know, basically fluff pieces. Well, that same year, the journal's editor, that's Arthur Brisbane, he showed up at the hen's coop with three letters seeking personal advice that had been sent to the journal's letter to the editor column, and he asked the women to answer them. But Manning had a better idea. She suggested an entire column where people could write in with their personal problems and, of course, get advice in return. Brisbane liked the idea, and he gave it the go-ahead. Now, since this was late Victorian times, it was still considered indecent for a proper lady to write under her real name, so Manning suggested Beatrice Fairfax. Beatrice, because she'd been reading The Divine Comedy by Dante, and Fairfax for the Virginia County where her family owned a home. The column turned out to be a smash hit, but the journal only considered it part-time work, and they paid her very little for her efforts. So by 1905, she had had enough of the grueling work schedule, and she quit. After that, she married, she had children, and she devoted herself to suffrage work. But the problem was that her husband was a poor businessman, so they were forced to live off of her inheritance. But they lost everything in the 1929 stock market crash. Manning really had no choice but to resume writing as Beatrice Fairfax, 
and she did that until she died of a heart attack on November 28th of 1945. So here's just one little selection of Dear Beatrice Fairfax. This was published in the June 29th, 1899 edition of the Omaha Hotel Reporter, although it was syndicated and appeared in newspapers all across the nation. It reads, Dear Madame, I am a young lady of 16. I am going with a young man of 19. I love him very much. He told me he loves me too. He used to walk around every night, but he bought a bicycle and he only comes once a week. I am not bad looking and he is a nice gentleman. And now I'd like to know who does he care for, the wheel or me? Please give me some advice on how to find out. And it's signed GG. So how would you respond? I'm thinking a bicycle? Hmm. I should point out this is 1899, so a bicycle was a really, really big deal back then. Automobiles were virtually non-existent at this time. So let's listen to how Beatrice responded. Perhaps he thinks the best illustration of the proverb, love me, love my dog, is for him to love his wheel first, and then you will love it too. It is not that he cares less for you, but more for the wheel. Why do you not ride too? Next up, we have an advice column written by Laura Jean Libby, and she was an incredibly popular American writer back in her day. She sold over 15 million books, but they're hard to find, and that's simply because she wrote dime novels. Basically, they were meant to be disposed, and that's what most libraries did with them. Now, I'll admit I haven't seen any of these books, but uh, from what I read, the general theme was, you know, a beautiful young lady, she'd meet a wealthy gentleman, there'd be some sort of tangle between a villain and a hero, ultimately it gets resolved, they marry, and they live happily ever after. One of her few unsuccessful ventures was to write this advice column, and many attribute that to her mother. Her mother was very controlling and forbid her to marry, and as a result, her answers in this column tended to be very old-fashioned, and that didn't attract readers. I should point out that when her mother did pass, she married at the age of 36 to a lawyer named Van Matter Stillwell. Anyway, here's one of her columns. It's titled Letters and Answers. This is from the July 10th, 1911 edition of the Chicago Tribune, and it appeared on page 6. Dear Miss Libby, Since you've been so kind in helping girls who have admirers, I wish you would help one who has none. I am 20 years old and I have many girlfriends who are pretty and popular and who see I get invitations to all the dances they attend. As I am homely, I have my program filled only through the efforts of my girlfriends. Now, I would like to know whether it is fair to the boys to have me pushed upon them. Would you give up going to dances and attend to something else if you were I? And it's signed Lonely. Well, that's uh, quite sad, isn't it? Anyway, here's what Laura Jean Libby wrote back. Are you a good dancer? Lonely? A girl who's a good dancer usually has little trouble in having her program filled. Why not take a few lessons at some high-grade dancing school near your home? Don't forget that many homely girls are loved sincerely for their qualities of heart and mind. Be cheerful and sociable. (laughs) Wow, that's definitely not the answer I would have given. I have to tell you, I was a teacher for 30 years in high school, and uh, this would come up quite a bit, particularly around prom time. And young people's perception of who they are, you know, and how they fit in, it's usually just totally wrong at that age. Now, this just loosely reminds me of a story that happened uh, while I was a teacher. This is probably about 20 years ago. I had a boy in my physics class, and uh, he wanted to ask this pretty girl out to the prom, but of course he felt he was too average and she was out of his league. So I'm just talking with him one day, and I said, you know what? I have nothing to lose. I'll ask for you. So she was in my classroom. I think it was during her lunch period, you know, just catching up on some work. And I purposely said, this is not about me, but there is a boy who'd like to ask you to the prom. And she knew exactly who I was talking about, and she agreed to go. And I believe they went and had a good time. This next column ran on October 5th, 1911 in the Rock Island Argus and was penned by Mrs. Elizabeth Thompson. The title of the column is Heart and Home Problems, and I believe the column ran for about four years beginning in 1911, and I'm not sure if Elizabeth Thompson is her true identity or a pseudonym. 
Anyway, here's what a young gentleman wrote. Dear Mrs. Thompson, I have a girlfriend of whom my parents disapprove. They threaten to make me leave home if I do not stop visiting her. I am 18 years old and my friend is six months my junior. I think a great deal of her. What would you advise me to do? And it's signed, Worried. I have to say my parents were nothing like that. If they disapproved of a woman I was dating, they wouldn't say a word, at least until I broke up with her, and then they tell me exactly what they thought. So let's hear what Elizabeth Thompson had to say. The judgment of parents in these matters is never amiss. The eyes of maturity see with a clearer vision than those of youth and inexperience. You are not too old to obey your parents, and by doing so, you'll be saved the suffering that will come from the penalty that always follows disobedience. So, did uh, Worried take his parents' advice, or did he marry the girl? I guess we'll never know. Now I have for you two articles that were both edited by Betty Breen. And unfortunately, I couldn't find anything out about her, so maybe a pseudonym. But there is a little blurb that reads... Miss Breen desires to give helpful and sane advice to all young people who find their pathway strewn with briars. Readers are invited to write her in care of the Phoenix, and that's the Muskegee Daily Phoenix that they're referring to. The earliest of her columns that I could find was dated September 23rd, 1919, and the last was April 12th of 1929, so just shy of a 10-year run, which is actually pretty good. Her columns were also featured in the Springfield News Leader, which is in Missouri. Now, the stories I'm going to read to you are from the January 1st, 1920 publication of the Muskegee Daily Phoenix, and that's in Oklahoma. And the upper one is titled Cupid's Corner. My dear Ms. Breen, as you've been helping the other girls who have written to you, would you please give me your advice? Everyone seems to think that I am a roughneck and no one will have anything to do with me. The girls are the ones who do not associate with me. I am going with a tough boy, but I like him better than any I have ever seen. He is the dearest boy, but he is bashful, though, excepting when we were out by ourselves. He wants me to go car riding three times a week and go to church about 14 miles from where I live. He doesn't want anyone else along. I like him very much, though. Please give me your advice. And it's signed Louise. I should also mention this is an advice column. They spelled advice wrong. It says advise. Anyway, I don't know what you think, but this guy is definitely no good. He goes car riding and he takes her to church. So here's a response. And again, this is from 1920. People form opinion of their neighbors by their actions. If you have gained the reputation among your friends as being a roughneck, be very careful where you go and what you do. Don't be boisterous as you have doubtless been. Take away the cause for these people's opinions and you will soon gain the reputation of being a modest, sensible girl. I would advise you to stop the relations between you and your boyfriend. The fact that he asks you to go to church and objects to anyone else going with you justifies the opinion that he is not the most desirable. After all, it is just women that came yesterday and will go tomorrow that you like this boy. And her column that appears beneath this is simply titled Everyday Etiquette. The question is, is it proper for a young man, when he meets a girlfriend on the street, to stop her and converse with her? And she offers up the following advice. No, if he must talk with her, he should turn and walk with her in the direction she is going. Not all advice columns dealt with personal relationships, For example, one of the most popular columns during the first half of the 20th century was How to Keep Well by Dr. William A. Evans. And he was extremely well qualified to pen this column. He received his medical degree from Tulane University in 1885. Then he did his postgraduate studies at the Pasteur Institute in Paris. He was the president of the Chicago Medical Society from 1902 to 1903. And in 1907, he became Chicago's first commissioner of health. He was considered to be the most well-known and respected doctor in the United States, and he played a major role in writing the papers detailing the best practices of social distancing during the 1918-19 pandemic. As for his column, he was originally the health editor at the Chicago Tribune. That was from 1911 through 1914. 
and he would regularly answer reader questions, and that evolved into this column, How to Keep Well. He is considered to be the first syndicated health columnist ever in the United States. And the article I'm about to share with you was published on September 12th of 1920 in the Chicago Tribune. It begins, Mrs. J.H. writes, quote, We have a number of cases of smallpox in our city. I had smallpox two years ago and had it hard. I have a few marks on my back now to show I had the disease. I have been in contact with a person for the last two weeks and she now has developed a bad case of smallpox. Do you think there would be any danger of my contracting it again or could I give it to others? Three doctors have told me no. Has it ever been known to happen in less than from seven to ten years where one has had it? And here's the good doctor's reply. You are in no danger. An attack of smallpox confers a lifetime of immunity. There are a few exceptions, but not many. I have known of two cases, but in each instance, the interval was a long one. The danger of a well person who is reasonably careful carrying the disease is slight. Whatever harm you might have been capable of doing has already been done, and there is no remedy now. What is the matter with you people anyhow? Don't your city authorities know that if they do not stamp out smallpox in hot weather, they will be in danger later on? Don't they remember the history of Niagara Falls? Why are cases of smallpox allowed to go two weeks without diagnosis with people coming in and going out of the sick room? Well, uh, Dr. Evans certainly made it clear he was not happy with this situation. And he did mention Niagara Falls, and I'm fully aware of the controversy over vaccines right now, so I'm going to tread lightly, and I'm just going to briefly tell you what happened. When the outbreak of smallpox began in Niagara Falls in the spring of 1913, the city was just one of three in New York State that didn't require vaccination. Not only that, but New York State law required that all students in public schools be vaccinated prior to admission. But the residents in Niagara Falls were mostly fearful of vaccinations, and they felt it was their personal choice whether they should vaccinate or not. So to avoid controversy, the school board simply tabled the idea of vaccinating their students. Of course, Niagara Falls is a tourist city, and people would come and go, and what they were doing is they get infected with the smallpox and take it to other towns and cities and give it to people who are also unvaccinated. In fact, Canadian officials went so far as to forbid any unvaccinated resident of Niagara Falls from entering their country. By January of 1914, smallpox was simply out of control. And the only way to stop the spread was to close the hotels, the businesses, theaters, and all public spaces. Of course, that had a devastating effect on their economy. Whenever smallpox was discovered in a particular location, all the residents were both required to quarantine and get vaccinated. It wouldn't be until February 2nd of 1914 that the Board of Education in Niagara Falls finally forbid unvaccinated students from attending school. Of course, there was also mass panic among the population, so they also got vaccinated, and that brought the epidemic to a close. By mid-March, that was the end of the smallpox epidemic in Niagara Falls, and they've never had it since. As you'd expect, this came at a very high cost to the city of Niagara Falls, and that's why Dr. Evans was so upset in his written response. This next bit of advice comes from a Mrs. Evans, and to be honest, I didn't find any personal information on her. I really very much doubt that she has any relationship with Dr. Evans, and I'm just going to place her in the unknown columnist category for now. This article was printed in the May 30th, 1927 edition of the Cincinnati Post on page 5. And here's what the reader had to say. I am 29 and my husband is 35. We've been married 10 years. We have three dear children. He is jealous and accuses me of things I don't do until he has killed my love. I was all a wife and a mother should be until a year ago. A man came into my life. I thought I loved my husband when I married him, but I found out this is my first love. I love him better than life itself and he seems to love me. This man is married to a dear woman. My husband seems to care a lot for me now, but it is too late. 
He has been so cruel in the past. I don't appreciate anything he does now. And I don't feel I can ever treat him right or be a wife to him. Please tell me what to do for I am the most miserable woman on earth. Should I get a divorce or live with him and be dissatisfied the rest of my life for the sake of the children? Do you believe this man cares for me? It seems he has proved his love in every way a man could, but I can't trust men. And it's signed, worried wife. So if you were Mrs. Evans, what would you say? Get the divorce or live with this guy for the rest of your life in misery? Well, here's what she wrote. My dear reader, two wrongs do not make one right. Playing checkers with husbands, as it were, getting a divorce from one, breaking up another home, and perhaps the heart of a wife to marry her husband will not obtain happiness for you. Forget yourself and live for the babies you have brought into the world. They have a right to expect of you a fair chance. So long as a child has a good mother, it has riches beyond price. Unfortunately, these things are written anonymously, but I'd love to be able to go back and find out what happened, wouldn't you? Next up, we have a column by Dorothy Dix, who was incredibly popular in her day. In fact, her only real competition was Beatrice Fairfax, who I discussed earlier in the podcast. Her real name was Elizabeth Merriweather Gilmer, and she began the column in 1896. She claimed she chose the pseudonym of Dorothy Dix because she liked the name Dorothy, and Dix was in honor of her family slave, a guy named Mr. Dick, and he supposedly saved the family silver during the Civil War. At her peak in 1940, it said that she received 100,000 letters per year and had an estimated audience of 60 million people throughout the English-speaking world. My understanding is that in Australia, there's a term called a Dorothy Dixer, and that's where a politician responds to a planted question, so that way they sound really good. And this term is based on Dix's reported practice of making up questions, you know, so she could write really good, clever answers. So I don't know if this question from November 19th of 1931 is real or not, but I'm going to go on the assumption that it is. Here we go. Dear Miss Dix, I have a son of 14 who's been brought up in an atmosphere of girls and elderly folks and much prefers them to boys. He is rather of an effeminate turn, was crazy about dolls, and played with them when he was a small boy. He is always admiring the artistic in homes, flowers, paintings, etc., and when he goes shopping with me, he exclaims over the beauties of materials or the style of costumes. He is fond of music and plays the piano beautifully. And because of these traits, he is called a sissy by other boys. His only fault is that he's so untidy about the house and his clothing. His room always looks as if a cyclone had passed through it. I am worried over him. What is the best way to deal with such a lad? And it's signed, Distracted Mother. And here's her answer. And I'm probably going to stumble through this because it's a little blurry. Here we go. Well, his being disorderly about his room is at least one normal boyish trait. Practically every boy of 14, except those that exist in goody-goody books, hangs his clothes up on the floor and tracks in mud and uses his bed as a dumping place for all his belongings. And his mother can either pick up after him or bring nervous prostration on herself, trying to instill ideals of neatness and order into him and to convert him to the wisdom of having a place for everything and everything in its place. My advice is to take a line of least resistance and pick up after him and let nature take its course. It will save wear and tear on your constitution, and after a while he will just grow out of his slovenly ways himself. Some of the most orderly men I know were the greatest scatterers as boys. You see, a boy's mind is so engrossed in such vitally important matters as food and football, bicycles, or whatever the craze of the moment is, that he hasn't the time to hang up a cap or put a coat on a hook. But after a while, he'll find out that order is heaven's first law and that it saves worry to systemize things. Then he won't be a boy any longer, and you will wish that you were picking up muddy shoes off the bureau and fishing his best necktie out from under the soiled clothes in the closet. 
You certainly made a great mistake in rearing a boy who has a strong feminine streak in his nature in an environment of old people and girls. What he needed was to be associated with boys. He needed to be hardened and roughened, for this is a hard, rough world that makes life difficult for timid, gentle men. My advice to you is to send your boy off to a boys' school. But if he's too unhappy there, and if the boys bully him too much, don't make him stay. Sometimes the sissy boy becomes the victim of every bully in a school and has his whole life warped by the ridicule he is made to endure. And don't think your boy need be a failure because he's not like other boys. Some of the greatest geniuses the world has ever produced are regarded as sissies in their boyhood. Probably Paderewski was derided by the boys in his neighborhood because he spent his time at the piano instead of playing their games. And even in commercial life, there are great opportunities for the man who knows color and style of fabrics instinctively or who likes to cook and do other things that used to be considered as belonging to a woman's sphere. Dress designers and chefs draw huge salaries and no shops are more prosperous than those that deal in women's wear. So study your son and develop him along his own lines. After all, what is there more to be ashamed of in a boy having feminine qualities than there is in a girl having mannish ones? And every girl is flattered to death if you tell her she is boyish. Wow, that was quite the lengthy response. And to be honest, I don't think that's a response one would get today. On November 14th in 1941, the Brooklyn Daily Eagle ran the following ad and it described a new advice column they were launching. It reads, The jury decides. A new daily feature that's guaranteed to be different from anything you've read starts in the Brooklyn Eagle Monday, November 17th. A jury of 12 average Americans will help to decide your own intimate problems. Here are some of the intimate questions confronting the jury. Must she reveal her past to her fiancé? Marry at 30 without love or wait? She wants to work. Her husband says no. These and many more questions will be answered when the jury meets starting Monday, November 17th in the Brooklyn Eagle. The questions published and you're invited to submit your own should prove highly interesting to all readers. Start reading The Jury Decides next Monday in the Brooklyn Eagle. And sure enough, the first column ran on November 17th of 1941, and the last installment was on January 30th of 1943. And here's how that first installment reads. The jury decides. Has a wife the right to open husband's mail? Today's case. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, do you believe a husband has the right to keep things from his wife? When I married, I thought I was becoming a member of the kind of a partnership that prevailed in everything. I had been married little more than a year, and I've already learned differently, much to my own disillusionment. Ever since our marriage, I have opened my husband's mail and thought nothing of it. I never felt anything about it because I felt that any letters addressed to either of us concerned us mutually. I thought my husband felt so also since nothing was ever said about it until just recently. The other evening, my husband picked up some open letters off the table and turned on me angrily. He said he was fed up with having his mail opened. I could hardly believe him at first. I was so shocked at his words. Thinking of it now, it seems very strange to me that all of a sudden he should begin worrying about having his mail opened, and I wonder just what is going on that he doesn't want me to know. I didn't open his mail to spy on him. It was merely because I felt it was a privilege any wife or husband could enjoy and has a right to. Don't you agree with me? So if you were sitting on this jury, how would you decide? I can tell you in our household, which is just my wife and myself, we typically don't open each other's mail. And it's not even something we ever discuss. It's just something we started when we got married and we continue it to this day. But I should add to that that we have nothing to hide. We do get an occasional bill, but almost everything else is junk mail. And here's how the jury voted. There were six women and six men on this jury. 
One of the women voted yes, five were no. For the men, one said yes and five were no. So basically, we have two yeses and ten noes. And they do provide a brief statement from each of the 12 jurors. I'm just going to read six of them to you. The first is from a radio repairman. Quote, No, I don't agree with her. A married man doesn't have much. He at least ought to have the choice of opening his own mail. From a female college student. If I were married, I'd expect to open my husband's mail. That doesn't seem like asking so much. This next one is from a female radio singer. It's not a very smart thing for any wife to do. It hurts a man's self-importance, and that's always fatal. A parking lot attendant said, I'm against it. I'm against anything that gives women more rights than they got now. A railroad brakeman stated, You can't blame the husband for getting sore. Did you ever see the way a dame carries on when a man opens one of her letters? And finally, this one's from the owner of a restaurant. I think I smell a mouse. People usually don't get excited about opening somebody's mail unless it's jealousy. Wives ought to leave Papa's mail alone. Next up, we have a syndicated column from February 23rd in 1944, and it ran under the banner of Today's Children. It was penned by Ruth Crowley, who was a registered nurse, and she began writing the column for the Chicago Sun newspaper in 1941. This is before it became the Sun Times in 1948. And I'm not going to read the entire column to you. I'm just going to read the first few paragraphs and one other that I thought was interesting. And the reason is it's a quite lengthy article. But there is a really good reason why I'm including this column, and I'll reveal that afterward. The article begins, My child won't eat, says one mother. Of all the problems mothers have to meet, this one of eating constitutes the most vital. Why won't Johnny eat spinach? Why does little preschool Alice pick at her food when formerly she ate more than her older brother? Why does the 12-year-old lad suddenly go fussy about his food while his 16-year-old cousin eats everything but the kitchen sink? And then she goes into her explanation. There are many reasons for children's eating habits, and one of the most important is that their appetites are influenced largely by growth cycles. And after this, Ruth offers paragraph by paragraph the different stages of growth. But my favorite one is this one because she avoids the term puberty. Here's what she says. When the glandular processes begin their upheaval about the age of 12, children become picky and finicky about their food and are likely to cater only to their decided tastes. And from there, she goes on to conclude her explanation. So why did I include this? Well, in 1943, Crowley began writing a second column for The Sun, but she didn't want to confuse her readers with the two columns. Therefore, she opted for a pseudonym, and she chose the first name of Anne. It was just chosen at random, and then she borrowed the last name of a friend. She became the first Anne Landers. And while she did take a break from the column from 1948 through 1951, she continued to write as Ann Landers until her death on July 20th of 1955. She was only 48 years of age. The hunt was on for a new Ann Landers. And various writers, they filled in for the first three months after Ruth Crowley's death. But on October 16th of 1955, the new Ann Landers would make her debut. She was Esther Pauline Letterer, who was better known as Epi to her friends, and she would continue on as Ann Landers for the next 47 years. Her version of Ann Landers would become the most widely syndicated columnist in the entire world. She appeared in more than 1,200 newspapers with an estimated audience of 90 million readers. When she passed away on June 22nd of 2002, she opted not to have someone assume the role of Ann Landers, and the column ended shortly after that. So I thought it'd be interesting to go back and find that first column, and here it is. This is again from October 16th of 1955. Dear Mrs. Landers, I've always regarded most maritable mix-ups as very humorous, until now, that is, when the noose is tightening around my neck. We have been married 10 years and have two sons. I like auto racing, but my wife has no interest in it, so I've always gone without her. 
I've fallen for a woman with three children who is very fond of auto racing. Her husband is ignorant and impossible. This may sound corny, but I think she'd be a wonderful companion for me. I suppose you think I'm a louse, but I am stumped. I would like to have your advice on this problem and assign Mr. K. And here's her response. Dear Mr. K, time wounds all heals and you'll get yours. Do you realize there are five children involved in your little racetrack romance? Don't be surprised if you wake up one of these days and wish you had your wife and sons back. You are flirting with a muddy track on Black Friday and the way you're headed, you will get exactly what you deserve. I have to say that is classic Ann Landers. She didn't pull any punches and she got right to the point. What everyone needs is some competition. In this case, Ann Landers' competition came from her identical twin sister who went under the name of Abigail Van Buren or Dear Abby. I already told you that Ann Landers was Esther Pauline Letterer. Her identical twin was Pauline Esther Letterer. They just switched the first and the middle names. Supposedly, she created the name from the biblical character of Abigail and the last name of U.S. President Martin Van Buren. Anyway, Dear Abby was first published on January 9th and 1956 in the San Francisco Chronicle, and it was syndicated within weeks. This is just coming three months after her sister's debut as Ann Landers. And just like Ann Landers, her column would be featured in more than 1,200 newspapers and reach an estimated audience of 95 million readers. She did continue writing Dear Abby by herself until 1987, and that's when her daughter Jeannie Phillips began co-writing with her, and her daughter did totally take over in the year 2000. Mom died on January 16th of 2013 at the age of 94, and the column is still published today. So here's one of her columns from December 5th of 1957. Dear Abby, our son married a girl when he was in the service. They were married in February, and she had an eight and a half pound girl in August. She said the baby was premature. Can an eight and a half pound baby be this premature? And a sign wanting to know. And I just love this answer. Dear Wanting, the baby was on time. The wedding was late. Forget it. Sometimes the meaning of terms, it evolves over time. You know, what it meant many, many years ago is very different from what it means today. And the author of this next column certainly fits that bill. Her name definitely has a different meaning today than it did when it was first written. And I'm not going to explain the column was called Boy Dates Girl, and it was written by Gay Head. This was an in-house pseudonym that was used at Scholastic Magazine for many, many years. The column was first created in 1936 by Margaret Hauser, and it was intended as an advice column for teenagers, and there were a number of books written uh, under that pseudonym. Apparently, she chose the name because of her fondness for the town of Gay Head on the island of Martha's Vineyard in Massachusetts. Now, don't go looking for that town today because by a vote of 79 to 21, they officially changed their name to Akina in 1997. Others would go on to pen this column that included Ruth Imler Langerich from 1948 to 52. This particular one that I'm going to read to you is from the November 30th, 1960 edition of Junior Scholastic. The question was, should a girl give a boy a present? And the answer given was, boys should take the lead in practically all boy-girl situations, and gift-giving is no exception. It's embarrassing for a boy to receive a gift from a girl when he has no gift to give her in return. Although you naturally don't give gifts with the thought of what you'll get in return, even your generous nature can cause embarrassing situations which should be avoided if possible. If you really want to do something nice for a boy, bake him a batch of Christmas cookies or fudge and wrap your gift in gay paper. Put the package under the Christmas tree and if he comes calling on Christmas Day, give him your little remembrance from Santa. He'll like anything which he knows you made especially for him. One gift which you should avoid giving a boy is a picture of yourself, unless it has been earnestly requested and you've had a recent photograph taken for some other purpose. 
If you buy a gift, don't make it an expensive one or a personal one, which will embarrass both of you. You have no reason to feel bad if a boy appears with a gift for you and you have nothing for him in return. A warm smile and a please thank you are all that are needed. If you want to, you can surprise him at a later date by baking him a cake or knitting him a pair of argyles for his birthday. Surprise gifts are fun to receive too. Well, I have to say, I've been gypped. No woman has ever knitted me a pair of argyles. <laughs> I'll share two more with you. This next one is called Ask Beth and it was written by Elizabeth Winship. She'd been working at the Boston Globe as a children's book editor, and in 1963, she was asked by a Globe editor to write an advice column that would connect with young readers. At its peak, Ask Beth ran in 70 newspapers. Her daughter, who is Peg Winship, she was a family therapist and began assisting her mom in writing the responses in the 1980s, and then Beth retired in 1998 and turned the column totally over to her daughter. The column will continue until February 27th of 2007. So here we go. Dear Beth, I love to have visitors at our summer place, but I loathe and detest wrapping up and mailing the things they leave behind. And they always leave something behind. Toothbrushes aren't bad, but did you ever try to wrap a bicycle pump or a good set of deer antlers? I'm fit to be tied. And is signed Joan Kamalin. Dear Joan, I couldn't agree with you more. The article that topped our list of left behinds was a black cocker spaniel. So we kept the pup and lost our friends. I'm not sure if she's serious there or not. This is the sad truth. If you want the guests, you'll have to be resigned to running to the post office as soon as they leave. My solution is to keep a well-stocked closet of paper, string, tape, labels, and boxes with scissors chained to the door. Another tip. Try mailing small things in heavy manila envelopes. This reminds me of something that happened to us a number of years ago. My wife and I, we had rented a cabin for a week near Binghamton, New York, and that's about a two-hour drive from our house. And on the last day, we decided to take a leisurely ride back home, and this was a Saturday, and we got home, I don't know, maybe about 10 hours or so after we had checked out. But as soon as we walked in the door, we could see that the answering machine was blinking, and it was the campground calling us to let us know we left something behind. And the two of us looked at each other like, what could we have left behind? We went through that cabin with a fine-tooth comb. Anyway, Mary Jane called, and she found out she had left her MacBook behind in the cabin. I should point out it wasn't hers. It belonged to the school that she worked for. And she had hidden it so no one would steal it, and it also meant that we didn't see it to actually take it. Unfortunately, the campground refused to mail it back, so the next day we got in the car and we drove two hours there to pick it up, and then we drove two hours back. And this just happened to be my 50th birthday, so it was a great way of celebrating it. I didn't really care. But the clinch for this story is that the next day I go to the mailbox, this is a Monday, open it up, and there's my AARP invitation. Yes, I was officially a senior citizen. Welcome to the club. And the last one I have for you today is written by Judith Martin, who you probably know as Miss Manners. And she began writing the column for the Washington Post service in 1978, and it's currently carried in over 200 print and digital outlets. I should mention that since 2013, her children, that's Nicholas and Jacobina, they have joined on with her as co-writers of the column. So I thought it would be interesting to go back and find that original column and I'm not sure if I found it or not. The one I have is from January 4th of 1978, which is a Wednesday. I try to find one for the Monday or Tuesday. That's the earliest you could have in 1978, but I was unable to find it. So maybe this is the first one she ever wrote. Maybe it's not, but here we go. Question. I was brought up to open doors for women, but now some women are offended by the chivalry while others still expect it. How can I know the right thing to do? And here's Miss Manners' answer. It's amazing how many men are willing to give women equal rights in scrambling for bus seats or pushing through doors, but forget to support the Equal Rights Amendment. When women achieve their rights, it will be time enough to do away with such privileges. Open that door. 
Now, when I was growing up, my dad always insisted that I open the car door for my mom. But I have to tell you, I don't remember him ever doing it. Anyway, it's something I kind of still do to this day. I open the door for anyone, male, female. It doesn't really matter. If you're getting in my car, I tend to just walk over there, open it, let you get in, and I close it. It's something I really don't even think about much. Well, I do hope you enjoyed this new segment of the various advice columns. I do like trying different ideas from time to time, but I can never anticipate how they'll be received. So just let me know if you think I should consider recording another collection of them in the future, or if you don't think it's worth it. Or if you have suggestions for improvements, just let me know. I did struggle to come up with a name for what you just heard, and I narrowed it down to either questionable advice or dubious advice a few weeks ago. Now, my sole reason for going with the dubious advice was that it was far easier to fit into the cover art that I use for each episode. That's my only reason for going with it. And I would have loved to have recorded the questions and answers with other voices, but since I'm no longer teaching, I don't have a steady supply of teachers to read those parts or really anyone else. I did try to generate the various voices with AI, but I honestly felt they were a little bit too clunky. I played a few of them for my wife, and she only liked one of them. So I just decided to read the various parts myself. As for the artwork, if you have a brief moment, go to my website, which is uselessinformation.org, and take a look at the thumbnails for the bulk of the stories on the main index page. Just go down the main page. Almost all of them were generated using DALL-E on Microsoft's Bing search site. But just like AI writing, the AI-generated images were kind of hit or miss. My general observation is that it doesn't handle hands or faces well, but it does do well with other prompts that I give it. I do want to give a big thank you to all those who took the time out of their busy day to complete the listener survey. Be assured that I have read through all of the 76 written responses that were given, and I have given considerable thought to the various suggestions. As I'm sure you are aware, I'm always attempting to make the podcast better. And if you have enjoyed this episode of the podcast in general, I'd greatly appreciate if you could share it with someone, you know, whether that is through Twitter, Facebook, Reddit, or by whatever means you think will help grow my audience. Whatever you can do to help spread the word, please be assured that it's greatly, greatly appreciated. Just a reminder that you can find the Useless Information Podcast wherever you get your podcasts, so be sure to subscribe. Well, if you've made it this far, I'll just remind you that the Useless Information Podcast is now part of the Airwave Media Podcast Network. So be sure to visit airwavemedia.com where you will find a curated selection of some of the best podcasts in not only history, but also science, wellness, education, and the arts. Anyway, thanks for listening and take care, everyone. Bye.